Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Desert Gardening News, a Star Nursery podcast. I am your co-host, Madeline, and we are joined by host Joey Lynn, as well as special guest for today, Heather Ann Rose. Um, Joey Lynn, if you don't mind, would you uh, introduce yourself to our audience one more time? Yes, I'm Joey Lynn. I am Star Nursery Certified Arborist. I am uh, the other half of the Dr. Q's House Call Service, and we are a service that goes to your home and helps diagnose any issues um, that you might be having with any of your trees and shrubs and plants. So we're happy to be here at another another episode of Desert Gardening News, and we are so excited to have a special guest, special guest, Heather Ann Rose. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here. Why don't you start us out? Sure. Give us a little bit about you of and course. tell us your story. Yep. So I'm a local art, um, author. Excuse me. Um, I wrote a children's book series called the Rose Sisters Garden Series featuring my own daughters. Um, I have three of them, um, Audrey Rose, Poppy Rose, and Genevieve Rose. And the series kind of just features them going in the garden and sharing their experiences. And I wrote the series to kind of encourage families to go outside and explore what's living and growing in their backyard. Um, when I first moved here, um, I was raised in Napa and I moved here and I was like, oh my gosh, it's so dry and desolate here. <laughs> and, um, then I soon discovered that we kind of have the same grow zone as Napa. And I was like, wait a second, it's a little hotter, but I wonder if, and then I discovered there's a whole garden community here in Vegas area. So, um, or Southern Nevada area. And um, I just started growing everything. So I started with roses. I had about seven rose bushes in my front yard and grew like two dozen fruit trees, all bought at Star Nursery. Well, thank yes. you very much. Yes, <laughs> I had like grew every herb and vegetable. So I started like during COVID, we couldn't go anywhere, but Star Nursery, thankfully, was the one place that was open. So that was kind of like my safe haven. And I would bring my kids and we would just start project and project. And um, it just went from there. And um, I started this series because I am an educator Educator, and I couldn't find um, any children's books that kind of taught permaculture because that's a gardening um, a style or method that I fell in love with. And so I decided to write a children's book featuring that. So... That's well, why don't it. you tell our audience a little bit about permaculture and the uh, approach that you have in teaching that in children and instilling that lifestyle and that in children. So give us a little bit of information about how you approach that and communicating what it is. Yeah, so permaculture is kind of supporting the ecosystem that's inside the garden. So it's not just like farming where it's like monoculture, you're growing one plant. It's more so building a food forest and supporting the um, pollinators and growing certain um, like herbs or other foods around like a tree to kind of either be like a pet, like a trap crop. So there's just different ways to like help the garden support itself. So one, it's like less work for you, but also like it really supports the ecosystem and like having children. It's the coolest thing to experience. Absolutely. And did you find much support in our gardening community oh my gosh, in, yes. In, yes. in that and starting with the children? So go back a little bit. Um, to the process you had said that you're an educator um and so to come up with deciding that you wanted to write a book I mean that is <laughs> pretty phenomenal how did that process start in you so I actually went to school here to be a teacher and um I at the time chose to be a mom um so my husband and I we decided hey let's have a family and I was like perfect I can always teach so I decided to stay home and in that time um I was like I'm gonna homeschool my kids I'm gonna do this but then COVID happened and then nobody wanted to be around anyone so we ended up putting our children into Montessori education and that's when I fell in love with Montessori education which is kind of like what I do with my own um, educational resources and my books um, but I just realized I went on a trail so to come back to your question how I got into that is being the educator that I am I wanted to provide my kids with more hands-on activities mm -hmm. and books so when we're not out in the garden we're inside resting and reading books it's kind of like continuing that garden education and 
I personally, we, we've read the books and they're phenomenal. Thank they're you. They're beautiful to look at. Um, there's such great information. There's hidden little um, tasks within each book as well. And um, so how did that spark, like, I'm just so fascinated by the whole thing. I don't think that I could ever write a book. Yes, and so can. I'm I'm completely um, amazed at you. Was it mainly because of your experience with your children or was it something that you felt was lacking for your children? So it was kind of both. I mean, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm an educator. My mom's been a preschool teacher since I've been in preschool. Like being an educator is like in my blood. And so when I was out in the garden, it wouldn't just be like, hey, look, there's a bird. It would be like, oh my gosh, there's a butterfly. Why do you think the butterfly is here? And so my teaching method is a mixture of Montessori, which is kind of hands-on learning, um, but also inquiry-based. So in like in my books, I ask a lot of questions and that's what I did in the garden with my kids. Kind of, it's not like, hey, this is how the eco system works it's you asking them questions for them to kind of like piece things together themselves so that they can be it's basically teaching them to explore and be inquisitive learners Um, and that's really important for me so every page I ask a lot of questions you know it's not just like once upon a time it does start off kind of like that once upon a garden full of roses um but it's more so just engaging the reader um, because I wanted to teach families like, hey, there are books that are engaging. It's not just something to read at a child, Mm -hmm. but with a child. And that was really important to me. And we've also had Heather Ann at our locations with your Growing Kids events. Those have been phenomenal. We've had a lot of support from the community um, and they've come out. So thank you everyone who came to these events and got to experience firsthand the magic of this book series. Um, They were really, really awesome. Uh, Usually what we'll do is have a little activity for the kids to participate in and they get to participate in that book reading as well. And Heather Ann will guide those conversations about permaculture and gardening in a super fun way. And we look forward to having more events with you. Um, If you do see any of those events pop up on our Instagram or our social media or website, make sure to uh, get in those events quickly or find a ticket quickly because um, they sell out pretty quick. The reservations usually fill up very fast. Um, But if you'd like to speak a little bit more about your program, Growing Kids, and just what that entails for our uh, community and how you reach the community with that. Yeah, yeah. So Growing Kids, as she mentioned, is an educational program that I bring to schools or businesses or small groups. Honestly, anyone who wants to learn about gardening, get their hands dirty and have a great time. And um, I do really well with engaging with kids. Um, As she mentioned, I start off reading my books and as she, they had both mentioned, I have like an interactive um, find me character. So the first one is ladybugs. Ladybugs are the helpful, um, um, what is the word? Beneficial. Yes, thank you, beneficial insect. Thank you. You would know. (laughs) (laughs) Beneficial insect because they protect the rose plants um, from nasty aphids who we all despise. (laughs) Um, So it's really fun to like see them because some kids may not, you know, want to listen to the story, but it kind of still has the practice. Um, Give, provides them the practice to be engaged and give them a job to do. Um, as an educator, like I think it's really important to like don't just read a book once. So I like to read my books multiple times and I kind of like to share that with um, educators and like families or during my growing kids. So um, they find the character. I ask a lot of questions and I have to tell you, this is honestly one of my favorite parts during these events because it's a moment to ask questions and hear what the kids have to say. And they blow your mind, the things that they know, or sometimes (laughs) they just figure out themselves. I love interacting with kids for this reason. Um, So yes, my Growing Kids program um, has been super successful. As they mentioned, it was sold out. So we read the books and then we have a hands-on activity, which I'm super grateful for because they, um, Star Nursery as they, um, have provided all of the um, activity supplies for free. So these events were free for hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. I think it was like, we probably would have three events in a day and it was probably... 50 Mm -hmm. kids would probably sign up and sell out. Um, So it has been successful. Um, But one rule that I have um, when we always start 
is um, my number one role for parents is not to help the child because I, I want the child to be given the opportunity to like experience and try mm-hmm. things themselves. Cause I think it's so easy to be like, okay, here's a project. Here's the guy. This is what we're supposed to do. No, no, we're not doing it this way, but it's fun to like, let the child, um, go off and explore it the way that they choose mm-hmm. to. Cause that isn't that what exploration is all about. Absolutely. And that doesn't mean that the parents can leave no, 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 no. <laughs> but no, no. it's still it's still a hands-on for both of them, yes. but having that child leave. And it's really interesting. Uh, you had mentioned the fact that it's a multiple uh, engagement. You're touching that book Getting multiple times. Dirty. And yeah. I love that because you you even have projects in the back. It's going to be a resource. That's how I f- look at these books and your series. I envision a complete resource. What you have done to create these first three books, um, I'm just excited for you because I really think that it's something that's going to be um, part of a child's life. It's going to be in their little libraries. It's probably going to be the first thing that they go to. Any gardener out there, I know for a fact you have a small library that you are proud to go to and look back in the seasons and your series does that for children and it is the most exciting thing so I am so proud of you I want to go well what you mentioned that I absolutely love that the books are intended for them to be looked at multiple times over and over again. Not only do you have the story, but you have the running uh, theme or what to keep your eye out for. And then you also have the project in the back. And what I love about your series is that it's really going to become part of a child's library for gardening. I think that this gives children the ability to start their own gardening library. Every gardener out there has a little bit of room on their shelf that is strictly gardening that they go to each season. There's a topic um, that we'll, like for now, we're talking about thinking to plan for fall. So, a child wanting to learn about roses, they're going to go straight onto their library. So I'm just really excited for you. Thanks. I do want to know, how did you choose which book you, how did you choose your first book and how are you choosing each book in the series or is that something that's just coming naturally? Go tell us a little bit about that. Joey Lynn, that is a great question. Um, so there is a there's a main reason and idea for behind every book for me I am obsessed with roses like as I mentioned before I had seven dozen rose bushes lining my front yard like I love roses with a passion so the first book was obviously a passion project all of my girls middle names are roses so it's this is like my my baby and so I love flowers and I kind of wanted to share that passion to like grow what you love. When we garden, we're not just going to buy some random plants. We're going to buy what brings us joy. And so that is the main premise of the first one. The second one is growing strawberries. And spoiler alert, strawberries are a part of the rose family. So it was kind of like a nice little transition. But I also wanted to encourage families to grow what you love to eat. So we can grow to love or grow what we love to look at and then grow to like feed us and nourish us. And then the third one is um, the pollinator ABC. So grow to support the ecosystem. So encourage families to go outside and explore and little gardeners to go out and explore and And um, I'm currently working on my fourth book. And it's actually the end of my flower, um, like, section of my series. Um, It's Growing Marigolds. So it's kind of growing to harvest, to share, um, kind of, like, talk a little bit about culture. Because gardening is for everyone. Mm -hmm. And we have traditions that other cultures do. And I kind of wanted to showcase that a little bit. It's just fabulous. (laughs) I think that you're just fabulous. And I loved seeing everybody coming onto the property to support you and um, have uh, a 
craft that the kids could take away. I mean, the the memories for everybody involved, uh, the staff. This has been a great experience for them as well. It's been just fabulous. So the crafts that you do in the schools, are you doing hands-on projects when you do in the schools? So tell us a little bit about that program and um, how the listener could request you or yeah so my program is called growing kids and um i actually have like a menu for schools to select so i'm it's not just an author visit where i'm reading a story but as an educator i want to provide an experience so maybe um i have a few um ebooks that are on my website. Um, so growing writers. So I have writing prompts that focus on gardening and I have growing scientists. So I have science projects focus on rows or gardening, um, growing artists. So I have art projects, um, inspired by famous artists. So they're practicing different mediums, um, growing gardeners. So I'm teaching, um, different, um, garden, (laughs) gardening activities based on different ages so it's not just like okay there are different activities that foster certain ages Mm -hmm. that like kind of give them that responsibility so I'm kind of sharing that like hey everyone can have a job in the garden because you can start as early as you can so give them um give them the confidence to be like hey it's weeding day like you can handle this so i have that so i have a whole slew of growing gardening or growing kids guides so coming back to growing kids i have all of these resources and i have a ton of different activities and projects and crafts to do um, for schools businesses just to bring gardening in businesses and in the classrooms because gardening honestly should be everywhere it should. Should. And, Trying. Uh, research shows, too, that it does have a huge impact on all stages of life. Oh, yeah. And it's not just uh, when you retire and you have the time to garden that you should be gardening. Uh, the research all around the world just proves that gardening should start as young as you can, just like you said. And um, at any age, you can get in the garden, you can get in the dirt. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about this episode is what that impact is um, when you start your children in the world of gardening and then we're going to end our episode talking a little bit about what you're going to need to know for October and what to-do list um, you you're going to need to finish by the end of the fall so if you'd like we can get right into it today guys if you're ready oh yeah Well, in this portion of the show, we like to highlight a little bit about what's going on in the news today. And because we have our local author here, who is also an educator, it's important to talk about the importance of gardening um, on a child's development and what that means for the rest of their life, like I had just mentioned. Um, So we have in research that um, there's no denying the benefits of gardening when it comes to your health, when it comes to uh, your mental, your physical health, exercising in the garden for just 30 minutes a day has just a totally decreased any sort of heart disease in the future, can lower your blood pressure, um, can help with uh, pre-diabetes. There's so many benefits to being in the garden. And when you're nurturing a young mind, there's a lot of benefits that um, you, you wouldn't have even thought about when you introduce gardening to kids. So I'll list a couple of those right now. Um, for one, it teaches children to explore exactly like your books do and to ask questions about the world and to be free thinkers and not all education uh, like the education in the garden can really um, nurture that the way that environment the environment can you know and there's just so many questions about the environment that we have Um, another thing it does is it builds confidence it builds confidence in children to get out and explore but to also know that they they can do things. They can grow a plant from the a little seedling. You know, they can uh, go out and they can use scissors and prune off a uh, dead plant material. Little things like that can go a long way when it comes to confidence. And when you are nurturing the minds of young people, confidence is key because that is what's going to push them to be successful throughout the entirety of their life, really. Um, Another thing that it does is um, it actually benefits their diets 
throughout their life. There's a huge, lots of studies going on around the world when it comes to, um, you know, encouraging these school gardens. And the school gardens will teach the young children or young people about growing their own food and where their food is coming from. And a lot of people maybe have a fear of vegetables, like Brussels sprouts are not my favorite. I understand that. But if I were to grow my own Brussels sprouts, I would be a lot more inclined to eat them. And that's kind of why they encourage these school gardens. And there's not that many. Um, I think I have here that there is about 30% of schools with mm. school gardens. There, that's not a lot of school gardens. I think in COVID, there was a big push for gardening in general because you had the time. And so now a lot of educators are moving more towards um, teaching about gardening and recognizing those benefits, especially with new research that comes out about the benefits. Um, but there's still not that many gardens. So the more that we can do to educate young people about gardening about the environment the better it is going to be for them and the better it'll be for society in general when these younger generations are growing up to be leaders of the environment leaders of protecting conservation and also educating themselves and their peers about gardening and the, the benefits within that um, so if you guys have additional ideas you know what are some ways that parents can involve their children in the garden past your books or what are some ways to help educate um, children so it's a good point. Um, another resource that I just finished making, um, it's a gardening journal for kids and it's called Growing Explorers. And it's one of those like journals that you can give your kid and it's like sometimes I'm a mother of three I get it they drive us crazy and so instead of just like turning on the tv or like giving them a tablet it's like here's your journal go outside and go find something and like it's super focused like the first page it's like you know rub-a-dub dirt and it's like go outside find some dirt and rub it on this page and there's like all it's all these little prompts to that are very simple go look at the sky are there clouds in the sky draw what you see what animals you see so some of it is drawing activity some of his writing activities so it's kind of giving the child the opportunity to explore themselves so I mean I created that because I also wanted to be able to give children like a chance to like go out and do it themselves because sometimes us parents were tired or we're busy and so like we can't always be there holding them their hand giving them these opportunities but they can we can give an opportunity for them to find it themselves and it sounds as if the there's no specific age no. that's something for any age a middle schooler in an art class can go and really be creative with it it, it there's no age spe specific for that no. that's really amazing yeah and so that's more so for like elementary but I also do have like a guide that kind of as I mentioned earlier gives you like ages and activities in the garden so like even teenagers like you can teach them how to be an entrepreneur be like okay you're growing this how can you make money off of this like oh you have chickens like okay start a business and sell your eggs so it's kind of teaching them like to go beyond the garden and like sharing and you know I, I'm big on projects and so like you know give them authority and ownership to like go beyond the next step um so a lot of the time in school i think there's stigmas about science and how difficult science can be and this concept of stem and that you have to have this like great genius mind to be successful on the SATs when it comes to your stem courses like things like that can really have a damaging effect on children and that's why we say we need to build up this confidence um, there is one study of fifth graders who uh, were a part of their gardening classes scoring significantly higher if they um, it's yes yeah, scoring significantly higher on science exams if they were a part of this gardening class. And I think that it is so encouraging to be successful. But how does the failures in the garden also contribute to um, maybe the mindset that a child has going through school or going through life? And how does that prepare them? Yeah, so it just teaches them to be resilient. I mean... I fail a little lot of things. We all do. It's not just all about, okay, I finally got successful. This is what I'm going to show you. Like, it's so important to sh like, especially I also understand some schools are nervous about gardens because they're like, who's going to keep it up? But I think it's okay sometimes to have an empty garden bed because right now, like it might not be the right season or 
what we grew, what we tried to, was the seeds we sowed or we tried to grow, like didn't work. That's what happens. I can't tell you how many times I've killed plants. Like that's what you do. You kill it, you take it out and you try it again. You know, like yeah. whatever method that I had tried last time, maybe I overwatered it. Maybe I didn't water it enough. Maybe it had too much sun or it didn't have good companion plants surrounding it. Like I think that's part of like the process and anything with life. That's what you do. You teach kids like failing is so important because that's where we learned. And mm-hmm. then we're like adapting and growing with our gardens. And when you're educating children, do you ever get those types of questions? Like, oh, what if I kill the plant that I'm trying to grow? Or like, how would you explain that um, in like a kid's term? Like, oh, things die? Or? Yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. I, my kids, we talk about, I know this sounds so morbid, but like you talk about death. Like life is, death and life are hand in hand. So to like completely ignore it, like we just lost one of our dogs this summer. Yeah. And so like we had to... They, we were there and we had to talk about it because that is the process. I just had a friend who texted me. She's like, my dog is dying. How do I tell my kids? I'm like, you tell them. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no secret. And like, that's exactly what gardening is about. Like, you just try. And also, I'm sure Joey Lynn, people ask you all the time, like, do you know everything about gardening? No. Yes. Nobody knows. <laughs> nobody Abs- knows. No, yes. I do not have all the answers. And my answer may not apply to your situation anyway your situation may not have a specific answer there may be so many um factors that it 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 has to be approached in a way that we're kind of doing investigation and we're kind of pulling things apart and we're working long term together and i think that that's a really really great point is that um you're teaching how to get to a hopeful end result, which is to have a flower, the steps to doing it, um, to have strawberries, the benefits of having a plant that produces a strawberry that you get to to eat, the benefits of planting pollinator uh, plants that have pollinators and see how they contribute into the garden. And that's the process. And I that, that is the most important thing. And that our children learn that not everybody has all the answers no. and not every answer no. is going to fit into this perfect little box. And there's a long way to get there and a short way. You can either take the shortcuts or you could take the long cuts. <laughs> it's all about the journey. It's yep. all about the process of getting there. So yes, she doesn't claim to know everything. I definitely don't claim to know anything. <laughs> like if someone claims to know something, who was it? It was uh, Socrates, the, the, I know nothing, you know, yeah. the, you, you can't, if someone claims to know everything or they're like, this is, this is it like, no. So, and also what advice Joey Lynn or I, or anyone else may give you might not work for you. Right. So try it, but it might not work like trying over and over to get to your path to get there. I think that's what's so beautiful about gardening, too, is that we have specific seasons where we can almost guarantee that maybe something's going to work. You know, <laughs> We can almost pretty much guarantee like, oh, yes, yeah, something's probably going to grow. And that's almost like the confidence that you need to get started. And then we have seasons like the summer that we just experienced, like that's maybe right. nothing's going to work out. But that's kind of typical. Yeah. And you can feel confident that it wasn't totally your fault. <laughs> and that's just kind of life. I love it when you're talking about gardening. You can just see, you know, like you're talking about plants and your your eyes just light up like your whole face <laughs> brightens like you can just tell like you're so in love with gardening and with nature how is it um is it easy to engage children into that like wow amazement about nature is that like typical? oh my gosh yes yes yeah because when you're <laughs> excited about it then they get excited about it. it's not like okay here's this plant it's like yeah. look at this what do you see yeah. what do you think and so also children love to be heard and so when you ask them questions and give them like the pedestal to, to like have a voice it's everything to them and another part of my teaching method is I love getting on their level as like an adult it's so easy to just stand in your mm-hmm. natural posture and then you're looking down at a child but when you bend down and put your face right next to them like it's like, oh, they are giving me attention and I feel seen. And I think that that's what you do is you meet them at their level and engage with them with who they are at their level. Uh, have you 
I've seen like a lot of schools um, with any teaching gardens or with those programs. And uh, have you been able to talk with educators about your approach? So, yes, I've actually I know of two different nonprofits. There's one Green Our Planet mm-hmm. and Garden Farms. And um, what they're doing is they are nonprofits and they like basically manage the gardens at their schools and some of them I like will have a gar- or a farmer or a gardener mm-hmm. come and like teach the classes and also do a hands-on approach so that's definitely happening here I know it's happening other places so if you're looking for a nonprofit, you know support they're definitely like a really good one too and also they take volunteers too mm-hmm. so if your kids go to school like contact that um the nonprofit and like be there to help too because they need it I mean and they're always in need of financial support. Yes. So um, I know that they have a big uh, call to the community to get hands-on help and financial help as well so that they can keep the gardens going. And yes, the people that come in, they call them farmers. Yes, oh, do they? <laughs> yes yeah. they do. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. And they have a whole hydroponic side. Mm. Uh, not only it doesn't, the school doesn't have to have an outdoor garden. They will come into the school and they will put up hydroponic farms inside as well. So there's a lot of really great nonprofits. Um, and we can can make them available on our website as well uh we do on our uh information page we did at one time have the nonprofits up there and the community gardens um but we'll make sure that those are uh updated if necessary and we usually feature different community gardens in the area as well in our green pages. So I believe it's every other publication. You can look more into um, one or two different community gardens that can spark your interest and you feel free to reach out to whoever runs those gardens in order to help. Um, there's just a, there's a new one that we had been talking about, uh, Pumpkin. Pumpkin Park. Pumpkin Park in Henderson. And that's a brand new one. And I think they're still taking reservations for the plots of garden beds. So if you are a parent and you want to introduce gardening to your child, but maybe you don't have the space or the um, area, you don't want to do hydroponics at home, maybe rent out a garden bed for you and your family to take care of. And you can teach gardening that way. As we've discussed, there's so many benefits to teaching young people about gardening. And even if you're maybe you're not even that young, maybe you're in your 20s and you still want to get involved. There's a lot of community gardens that you can go to. I know Springs Preserve, there's always teaching gardens or teaching garden workshops that they do there get involved in our community there's so many different opportunities here and don't forget we have the cooperative extension and the master gardener program and that is all um for geared towards adult continued education and volunteering and you can reach out uh to them to learn about being a master gardener if you don't want to be a master gardener they have classes that the public can go to they have zoom there's so much information out there but i love the fact that this is focused on the beautiful children and our future and uh the book series is specific to an age uh your series that you do at star nursery uh what is the max age that usually we have i would say elementary age i mean children's books as an educator it's like you know pre-k till about second grade because usually about second and on that's when they start reading chapter books so it's you know honestly anyone that wants to read it because i know as adults they'll read it Mm -hmm. you know and they're like oh i didn't know that for example here's a little spoiler alert did you know that thorns they're not called thorns but they're called prickles Prickles. thorns yes thorns are more straight and they're longer and prickles curve so if, that's fun i know you think about like all these like hundreds of you know poems that are hundreds of years old and it's always up you know the thorn on the rose bush yeah but we, were, we were all wrong <laughs> in the, see in the we nevada, don't know everything that's right in the nevada nurseryman program they use you they use the term armament mm-hmm. and i think that's a little more technical Wait, but say it again ar- armament mm-hmm. or, i think that's Never. what i'm saying right Yes, um, like, cacti, oh. succulents, palm trees, they're armored. Okay. They have their Okay, ar- that makes sense now. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but yes. pickles armor- is more fun. Yeah, 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 exactly. like pickles. Yes. yeah, anybody who has pruned a Canary Island date palm themselves understands <laughs> that hidden armor. Oh, right in the shush. head or the eye. Oh, right in the arm uh, for me. In the and arm. I get a huge... <laughs> 
bruise and that takes up my entire arm. One thing that maybe no, not a lot of people know that there are some plants that actually have toxins at the tip of their armor. So to prevent somebody and sometimes it is the absolute most beautiful flower or uh might produce the most wonderful fruit fruit Mm -hmm. and it is because that plant is doing everything to protect itself so that it doesn't get eaten or plucked nature's amazing So, Heather Ann, do you have any other resources for our audience or maybe if there's community members out there that have small children they'd like to introduce the garden to and the environment to, what would you recommend for them? So come to my website. So all of the resources and the books that we discussed today are on my website. So my website is easy to remember. It's my name, www.heatherannrose.com. And um, all of the guides, um, growing writers, growing artists, growing scientists, which are STEM STEM activities, um, the reading guides. Um, I also have um, a growing guide for roses, but a growing for kind of finding your gardening technique that works for you guide. Um, but one thing I didn't mention is that I am a self-published author. Um, so I don't have a publisher that is paying me. I am, I had the idea, wrote the book, found the illustrator, formatted the book, printed the book. I did it all myself. So when I sell my books, that's because I did all of the work and, um, you know, that's, that's what I want. So I am also selling them on Amazon. Um, but it's Amazon. I don't need to like showcase them like um, I, you know, the amount of me as a, an artist and self-published author, I get paid this much versus, you know, mm-hmm. I get a lot more when I sell it myself. So if you want to support a small women owned business and a self-published author and a children, children's book author, come and support me for my um Uh, on my website but if you're not interested in um children's books i have activities for homeschools for schools for just a parent that wants to have fun um i also do have you know guides for adults so i'm hoping to like bring in you know provide as much information for a wide variety of people so that like we can just all be here and talk about gardening together Well, thank you, Heather Ann, so much for talking about your books, your other guides. um, And I hope everybody leaves this conversation with uh, a little bit more of a push towards educating children about gardening. I'm not sure how many parents are focused on that right now, but I think it's a perfect time to introduce children of all ages to the garden and to the environment. Um, Especially now that this is October, like we have so many things to do in the garden this month. There's just um, so many opportunities to bring your kids with you um, and talk about what it means to garden and what kinds of things you can grow and what kinds of things you can see in the garden, how that shapes the world. Um, And now is we're going to segue into our October gardening to do list. And we have a lot of things for our desert gardeners to focus on this month. Um, Joey Lynn, I'm going to throw the conversation your way and you can start talking about, um, you know, what our gardeners have to look forward to this month. Now is a great time to be planting our fruit trees and any deciduous trees, get them in the ground uh, before we start to see cooler temperatures. Um, right now also, you could we still have amazing transplants of herbs and vegetables in our stores. Uh, so you can come and get your broccoli and your Swiss char and your carrots. And um, we're running out of a little bit of time to get seeds in the ground. So you're not gonna really do very much in seed uh, sewing now, but the transplants for sure. And uh, Heather Ann, is there anything that you're looking forward to getting in the ground right now? Are you going to be starting any planting? Well, I mean, roses are, <laughs> that's an easy one. Roses <laughs> also kind of, it's the same thing with trees. It's good to like g- plant them now to get them a little established mm-hmm. before you give them their winter, you know, cut back and then to prepare them to get more stronger before our summer heat. So, I mean, that's what I would suggest. 
Now, you even do companion planting with your roses, don't you? Yes, I do. Um, so I know um, we don't do a whole lot of grass here because we live in the desert. And so there's a lot of rockscaping. Um, however, I've learned that when I personally, with my experience, is that when I have like a rock mulch around my roses, that the sun will magnify mm -hmm. and actually fry my roses. So one idea that I had discovered is like pushing them back, you know, maybe one or, or two two or three feet from mm -hmm. the rose bush, but I noticed then the soil was exposed. Um, and so then it became dry and then I would have to water it more. So that's when I discovered live mulch. So one thing that I've done is just put companion plants and honestly for roses, it's just other flowers. So I've used like Elysium, I've used marigolds, um, cosmos, any like, and it's honestly fun to do it when they're seeds because mm -hmm. then they grow even bigger. Cause like, yes, growing with, you know, transplants is fun but they only grow so big but when you do it from seed then then it's like they cover the legs of the roses and then it's just the the roots will grow and they will trap even more moisture and then the plants so like the soil is richer and they give back to the plant so it's you know building your ecosystem so that's one thing that I suggest too is do it, I do it for my trees so I can do like um, ground cover around my fruit trees, um, sometimes nitrogen fixers like beans because mm -hmm. um, it's it's bean season, right? Is mm -hmm. that for cool season? Yep. Beans? Right now. Yeah. Yep. You can get your snow peas and your beans in the ground. And uh, that's you could also do your cover crops right now if you want those to are really good. Uh, rest your soil and get those in the ground. But yeah, um, doing peas and beans now in your garden if you're going to want to do spring tomatoes and peppers now's a great time to get those in and be nitrogen fixers in the soil yep. um, mulch organic mulch compost worm castings all of that it seems like we talk about that in every season but it's because we can't talk enough about it we have a lot of high clay content and caliche and sand so, so sand. adding all of this organic matter is what over time changes the composition of our soil and allows you to become more successful in your growing if we start with a really great soil you're going to have really really great results so um you can never get enough talking mm -mm. about uh, mulching. Uh, you could even do wood chips right now. Let's say you have um, frost tender and you want to move more into a wood chip. So it's more of an insulation for your soil versus something that's going to decompose like uh, worm castings or compost. Um, but just make sure that if you do choose wood chips, stick with a, a natural something that's not dyed. Uh, you could do a small shave or a small chip. That is always really great because um, that will decompose. We want whatever we're putting over as a ground cover to eventually decompose. Yep. So here in, uh, we've had a ton of of um, monsoonal moisture um, and we're noticing I do a lot of house calls where there's um, fruiting bodies actually growing in the larger wood chips because in the desert all that moisture is just staying in that the woody part so if you've come out of the monsoonal season and you have um, um, mushrooms or you have fungal growth um, get pull it back, take it out, put down some new fresh, consider using, you can use the same thing that you used, but just use a smaller uh, size of the chips. That That's really helpful. Do you use any organic um, wood chips or bark or anything, or you just stick with live plants? I've done it all. I mean, it honestly depends on, you know, I've used pine needles. You know, I know that's hi highly acidic, but I mean, some plants require so, that. Yeah. And so I've kind of, I'm, again, I'm really big on supporting the ecosystem. So use what you have in your garden. If you have landscapers managing, tell them, be like, just throw the leaves in the pile over here and just use it. If you have chickens like me, they're poop is gold for your <laughs> garden so you know as long as the leaves are from a healthy plant yes 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 there's no powdery mildew on them yep. there's no uh 
rust. Yeah, that stuff spreads. Yes, it we spreads don't like that. really, really yeah. quickly. Well, and I will say this, though, like um, when I do do my winter cut back for my roses, I never use my roses because they are highly like they have a lot of mm-hmm. diseases and yeah. things that spread. So I've never used my roses for compost. So, yeah, it's a good practice to yeah. just get rid of it get rid of it help help it from preventing from spreading to another plant or yep. a neighbor some other things you could do is apply some more pre-emergence we have pre-emergence from high yields that will do well if you're um, finding a lot of weeds mm-hmm. in your yard you know those can spread especially with the moisture too and coming into the winter season we only have um you know, like a couple couple good months of really good weather before it gets pretty cold and you're going to have to protect your plants. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can use to insulate your plants as the organic mulch will insulate the roots. You're also going to want to um, maybe put a cover around your plants like fruit trees and we suggest burlap. That's a really good and expensive way to protect your plants. Do you have any other recommendations? Yes, the burlap for fruit trees would be for um, citrus. So citrus. Now, if you have a deciduous fruit tree, a tree that is going dormant, um, it wants the chilling hours. So you don't need to cover a uh, apricot or a peach, um, nectarine, plum. You don't need to cover those. But for citrus, something that is ever bearing, uh, you definitely would want to cover with burlap. Do you do any citrus? Oh my gosh, yes. So I'm... Yes, I I just recently moved onto an acre property, so we're kind of starting fresh with my garden. But I had um, grapefruit, lemon, lime, orange. Um, Yeah, and I was actually lucky. I had a couple that were like already established on our property. Mm -hmm. So that's when I kind of created the the food for surrounding it. So that was fun. Once citrus get established, they're fabulous. It is it is hard to get them established. These little plants, um, they need a lot of TLC the first few years, proper pruning Mm -hmm. early on, really great draining irrigation. Uh, So that's another thing that you can do right now is evaluate your irrigation going into winter. Uh, Plants still need to be uh, irrigated right now with um, our beautiful weather that we have. Um, We're still going to have a couple high temperatures so we're not out of um high exposure high sun exposure so we just want to make sure that we balance our irrigation well right now so you could be um checking on that making sure that your system is working properly um another thing to keep an eye out for are your pomegranates right now they're, they might be splitting. They might be showing that they're ready. The birds might be uh, getting in there. So uh, check check any fruit that's on your fruit trees or your plants right now for sunburning, mushy spots, cracking, bruising, that kind of stuff, uh, end rot. Get it. Just start cleaning up your garden. Start harvesting what's left. Um, and hopefully you still have a lot of stuff. I do. I have my basil still growing that I was so proud to mention that uh, wow. I, I was my we were talking about being successful in the garden. And uh, last month's episode, uh, we were speaking with Brandy, uh, the prudent homemaker. And I was we were talking about how things uh, work and don't work just like you and I today. And uh, this has been my first year I've been successful with basil from seed and it's still going. So as we know, we have pretty harsh summers here and a lot of exposure, like you just mentioned. There is a pretty good chance that some of your plants experience some burn, some summer stress. Um, Now is a good time to prune back all the damaged plant material. it's not going to come back, guys. Just take it off. And <laughs> let, yes. the, let the plant breathe a little bit before mm-hmm. it gets too cold. Um, you can look at our green pages. We have a huge publication um, all of about what you need to do in the fall. And so we mentioned fruit and citrus. We have a whole list of chill hours for different plants and different options um, and what to do about your fruit and citrus, as well as what to do about summer stress. So um, whether it's your roses or if it's your evergreens that aren't looking so evergreen right now, um, there are some great resources for you to check out if you want to head over to 
www.starnursery.com or pick up a Green Pages publication from our stores. They are free. Um, those are some great options. But yeah, definitely prune back um, the evergreen shrubs, remove your sunburn damage from all plant material, and then follow up with a little bit of Dr. Q's mm-hmm. plant tonic. It's a really great nutrient rich um concentrate that we have and you can use that within your irrigation all over it's good Mm -hmm. for anything really Mm -hmm. whether that's house plants or outdoor plants or anything finicky um just use that within your water supply and your plants will love you for it and another reason that we want to do a light pruning right now is that in this transitional temperature, the nighttime temperatures are coming down, the evergreens that have been working. And when we say evergreens, we're talking about plants that are for evergreen, not necessarily just like junipers and abervites and cypress. We're talking about any plant that is always green. It does not go dormant. It has been working on putting on new growth inside so the outer damage we've spoken about leave that sunburn in the extreme sun exposure to protect that tender growth well we need to allow that tender growth now to kind of harden a little bit before we go into winter as well because then we will have a frost situation if we don't so that's why we want to um, prune off any of the old damaged sunburnt sun damaged plant parts allow what ha- that is recovering that's growing with inside to get some sunlight get some oxygen flowing through it harden off a little bit because our extremes have been getting extremer extremer we haven't had a really super cold winter in a while so w- we need to not get too comfortable in that it could possibly happen that we get really cold this year especially since we've had a really wet um, monsoon season so in pruning we always help support the root system so that's what the dr q's plant tonic is for the plant tonic is to naturally stimulate the root system get it starting to move a little bit in the soil get some new fresh feeder roots on them so that they can start to pull up more water get that plant to put on a little bit more growth and then heading into that next season that plant is healthy it's at optimal growing um it's at its optimal growing state uh right before any of the very very stressful seasons well this is the time that we make sure that our plants are in their best health might be time to add a little bit of a nice light fertilizer as well so uh pick up the we have Dr. Q's organic stardust and the rose fertilizer. We have we get Dr. One, we Q's. We probably can get one more because yep. I know towards fall we want to not correct them too much. Right, but um, yeah. the Dr. Q's rose and flower food great for that. Um, get all of your um, for the strawberries. Now's the time to be hunting down uh, straw, them. right? Because mm-hmm. we don't sell it. Yep. Where do you usually recommend uh, your? people get straw for the strawberries so uh, i have a like a whole zoo of pets at my home (laughs) um chickens and desert Uh tortoises and guinea pigs and um we actually get ours um at a local um like horse supply that's like yeah right right near us so and they have huge bays barrels for like nothing so that's what i suggest and that's what you recommend in your your books right yep Yep, yep. So now's the time to find that to get that for them for winter. Yep. Yep. Can you give a little bit more um, background on using the straw for the strawberries? I have a picture. You got a picture? I do. Go ahead. Um, are you talking about for me or for her? No, for you. Oh, I mean, it's just like another mulch covering. I have like here a picture of my kids. So this <laughs> is kind of like showing how like the strawberry plant grows every season. But in winter, we cover with hay to keep warm in the snow. Of course, it doesn't snow here, except it did last year, like yeah. twice. <laughs> um, no, but it's just like another mulch, another way to protect mm-hmm. it from the frost. So, I mean, it just keeps a little insulation and just enough to make them snug in yes. bed during, during our resting season so love it yeah 
Um, are there any other plants that might need some fertilizing? Fruit trees, citrus, or? Uh, no, well, I think it all, de- right? It mm-hmm. all kind of depends. I mean, I'm glad that you mentioned roses because I was like, as soon as she pauses, I'm going to say roses because I'm like, <laughs> this, is my, this is my jam. But I mean, we get like a beautiful bloom. We get like one mm-hmm. last two raw. Yes. So I, what is it like end of October-ish? Mm-hmm. And it's in, as long as it's not windy because I feel like that always happens in spring here. It's like they all bloom and then the next day, Mother Nature is like, I'm going to blow it all away and it's like oh and then we gotta like you know bake in the summer and then fall comes and it's like remember we're still here yeah. so yeah fertilize a little bit i think roses are fine they we have to like force them into dormancy in winter because it doesn't do. get that cold for very long but that's usually like the top of january that's Correct. what i usually do yes yeah. you'll strip them Naked to nothing. And I, then I, I cut usually them bring down. them down to like eighteen inches, yes. and people are like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Just wait." That's right. Just wait. That's right. <laughs> and it is it is very very difficult to get people to come alongside because they know the struggle that they've had all summer long, and they finally see some progress of all their hard work in the fall, and then we're just in. January telling them okay strip them yeah, and to cut them back and they just look at me and they go no I can't do it I go pr- I promise you yes I promise you it will be better <laughs> and usually my friends are like can you come over and do it because I can't because it's my favorite thing like I feel like I'm have you ever seen the movie mommy dearest yes. where she like chops her roses and goes crazy and that's what I do I just get my loppers <laughs> and they go nuts and it's like the best it's the best like rage moment so <laughs> you know Take it out on your roses. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like your process of life. It's like, okay, we're coming to the end of the season. Let's let's let it go and mm-hmm. start fresh and new. And all of these activities, more than welcome to have your kids help you out with. You know, why have kids if they're not going to help you out on some garden <laughs> <Yes>. chores? <So. laughs> garden slaves. That's really yeah. what they are. <laughs> well, it'll do them some good as well. Yes, <laughs> yes. They're also going to benefit from it. <laughs> uh, are there any tips and tricks uh, for this month that you have left to share with our audience? Or is that it today? No, I think we have it pretty wrapped up. But you can head to our website. Uh, we have all the star notes up. We have... Um, a publication that is the cool season uh, vegetable guide. That's what you're going to be looking for. If you also want to head to the University of Nevada Cooperative Extension, uh, they have planting guides. But we have our very own Heather Ann Rose here who has planting guides for the fall as well. Um, And anything else that you want to send everybody to your website for, go ahead and tell us your website and all of your social. Yep, yep. So, oh my gosh, all the socials. Um, HeatherAnnRose.com. So it's um, Heather, no space, no capital A, just A-N-N, Rose, like the flower. Um, and then my socials, it's Miss dot Rose. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, you name it. So as we had mentioned earlier, ton of resources. We just want to instill passion for children and families to go outside and, you know, get their hands dirty, ask questions. And, and buy your book. Yes, please. I've lots yes. of books. Buy my guide. <laughs> buy your book. Yes, yes. It's, a, it's an investment in the future. Uh, give it as a gift. It would be a great Christmas gift yes. for any or Hanukkah. Look, you've got uh, three or maybe possibly. Oh, there's going to be more. Yeah, yeah you I, might be able to handle all days of Hanukkah with <laughs> all of the publications <laughs> that you have. Right? Oh, that's good. <laughs> Knock on wood. That's great. Well, we are just so happy that you came into our lives here at Star Nursery and um, anything that we can do to help uh, encourage our future and our children in our community and uh educate people to know that you can garden here it doesn't have to be made complicated it can be as simple as having your favorite book on your shelf pull it down with your baby or your your best friend's baby and uh just get a little dirty and get a little involved it's so exciting thank you for being with us today thanks 
Well, thank you guys so much for contributing on these topics today. I think that a lot of our parents or a lot of our educators are going to walk away just wanting more and wanting to know more and wanting to get their children knowing more about nature, about gardening. Um, if you are an educator or a small business owner or somebody who works with children that wants to bring growing kids to your place of work, um, feel free to go to Heather Ann's website and find her contact information and get in touch with her to start that program up um, where you work. Um, even if you, you know, maybe you have just like a big friend group and you want to do a big friend group event <laughs> with all the kids or the grandkids. I don't know. Some people have like 20 grandkids. So maybe, maybe you could do an event with just, you know, grandma and grandpa, but Heather Ann's there to guide the way. Uh, anything you'd like, uh, get in touch with her there. Also get in touch with Star Nursery through our social media. We are Star Nursery LD on Instagram, Star Nursery on um, Facebook. And if you are watching this on YouTube, you would know that we are Star Nursery Dr. Q on YouTube. Uh, we have a lot of of things going on starting in the fall and going on towards winter. So stay up to date with our events calendar on our website, www.starnursery.com. And look forward to our next episode. We are doing our podcast every single first Friday of the month. So um, each new Friday of the month, you can find a new episode uh, where the experts are here to guide you on what you need to know for the month. So again, thank you guys so much for everything that you have um, talked to us about today. I hope that everyone had a great time. We look forward to um, talking with you all again next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.